Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Patsord and I'm a psychiatrist based in London. And today I'm talking to Professor Adrian Furnham, who is a professor of psychology at University College London. And with a co-author, Ian McRae, he's published a fascinating book entitled High Potential, How to Spot, Manage and Develop Talented People at Work. So, Adrian, first of all, um, a large part of the book is saying this issue of talent. People like to talk about talent. It's, it's a buzz term in managerial circles. Um, but you, you quite pose the question, talent to do what? Why do you keep posing that question throughout the book? I think the answer is that um, talent is, in some senses, relative. It's, it's, it has, uh, you know, there are cultural differences in what people think of the talent. And, of course, there are... Um, very uh, different um, profiles of people in different jobs. So a talented musician might be very different from a, a talented uh, athlete, might be very different from a talented psychiatrist. That doesn't mean there are, of course, some uh, commonalities across all these, these people, and we write about how they will have some similar personality traits and so forth. But quite clearly, um, you will expect quite a different set of skills from people in different sectors or different uh, areas. And so you can't assume that one person aged 18 is a talented individual because the question is talented to do what? Talented to do what in one sort of organization? We know there are multiple factors which influence uh, potential and talent and that it's uh, relative to particular jobs. And what we do is try and make that point consistently through the book. But I also think, and I know it's dangerous to psychologize a psychologist book, I think there's a bit of psychology in you asking that question because I think what you're doing is um, you're challenging something that happens in the workplace and elsewhere, which is the awe that people hold to talented individuals. And because they, they, we put them on a pedestal, we don't ask some slightly more searching questions, which is what are they actually good at and what are they not so good at? Yes, absolutely. I, I think it, it can be very dangerous in organizations to have what is sometimes called the talent group because the assumption is that once you have been ordained or haloed or made talented or found as talent, that this talent doesn't go away and that there's talent for everything. And what you find, I think, it can be in many organizations very uninspiring and very uh, disenchanting if you find yourself not in the talent group. The problem for most organizations is that they put people in a talent group, they, they seek out and they try and find people with talent and I think that might be a good thing. But then they treat these people quite differently and to him who hath shall more be given often. So rather than helping those who they think are less talented, they give to more to those who are talented. And when, they, when you find yourself not in the talent group, the question is what group are you in? Are you in the talent less group? And can you ever get into the talent group? And this is I think one of the, the worries, this sort of the, uh, this elitist idea or the idea that there's something fixed about your talent. I always say to people it's terribly important that you have mobility in the sense that people can come, can come from a non-talented background into the talent group and indeed people can fall out of the talent group, that their talent hasn't, is not realizable or we made a mistake or whatever. In other words we need this mobility otherwise you do get the situation you've described. Now the other thing that you, you do with the book, you point out what happens to talented individuals in organizations and they often rise up to become leaders and you argue that talent isn't the same as leadership. Why is that such an important point for you to make? I think because, the, you know, I think there are essentially three types of jobs. I think there are technical jobs where, you, uh, where people are uh, doing some very, very highly sophisticated um, a type of work, an aeroplane pilot is somebody in, a, in a, a technical job, a brain surgeon is somebody in a technical job. I think the next type of job is what one might call supervisory or leadership jobs, where now you don't do the technical stuff that you were trained to do, you do the leadership. And thirdly, you have things which we might call strategic jobs. Now I think, in my experience, that there are people who are technically enormously talented, they're brilliant at what they do, and some organizations say, well, the reward for being brilliant is to be promoted into not doing it anymore, but being a supervisor or a leader, which is not a good thing. So you have an enormously talented brain surgeon, an enormously talented academic of a particular type, and then he or she is promoted into some administrative role where they don't have that talent and don't enjoy that talent. And I think that's the point we want to make, that you know, some people 
are extremely good at a technical issue, at a technical task, and they're not particularly good at leadership, and they don't want leadership. And leadership, people always think of talent in leadership terms. I think of it equally in terms of technical skills. Now, you've also analyzed in the book um, the multivarious different meanings um, over the years that people have attached or understandings to what talent is, trying to break down the concept. Mm -hmm. And you came up with a very interesting list um, where you looked at things like the cognitive capabilities of a talented person, so that means like the ability to think strategically or solve tactical problems, the personality of talented people, which you interpret as meaning emotionally and psychologically stable, then there's the learning qualities, leadership qualities, motivation, performance, which you refer to as the ability to deliver results. Um, could you say something about that, about that cluster att attributes? Are, are you saying that basically there, there is a core um, thing uh, that the talented individual tends to demonstrate in terms of these core features? Yes, I am. I'm saying, first of all, it, it's take intelligence or cognitive ability. I think you need to be bright enough. Uh, it de depends on what you're talking about. If you A bright enough um, uh, athlete doesn't have to be as bright as a, a, as a nuclear physicist, so to speak. But I think you need evidence that a person has uh, a, a certain level of, of, of intellect, because we know that brighter people learn faster, we know that brighter people think uh, more efficiently and so forth. So intelligence is one, one concept, one aspect of it. Next we, we worked on, on personality and, and came up with a model which we looked at quite carefully at the various components. And we think there are um, six components. One is uh, conscientiousness, people need to be well organized and, and hard working and prudent and, and, uh, and so on. They, we, they need to be emotionally adjusted, that is non-neurotic, they can cope with stress. We also felt that competitiveness, um, this desire to uh, win, to go ahead, to beat other people, to be more successful, to be the best in, in, in one's league is very important. Fourthly, there was this issue around curiosity. I always found curiosity a very attractive feature in most people. And it's about wanting to learn and about saying, how do these things work? How can I get better? How can this be done differently? Fifthly, there was the uh, acceptance of ambiguity or tolerance for ambiguity. Most In most jobs and in most world situations, the world is not clear. The future is not that clear. And you have to make do with a level of ambiguity. People with talent are not un made uncomfortable by lack of um, ambiguity. And the final component we came up with is, is courage. And there's different types of courage. There's moral courage. There's interpersonal courage. There can be even physical courage. And that is the courage to take risks, well-reasoned risks, but risks within a certain area. So we think that is those characteristics nearly always um, are associated with people in, with, uh, who we would class as having talent or potential, whatever uh, career or whatever job they're in. You also argue in the book that even if your organization um, has um, got talented people uh, within it, um, there's a sense in which the problems kind of start there, which is how do you retain talented people and how do you develop the talent? Could you say something about that and in particular um, why do you think organizations are so bad at retention and development of talent? Yes, um, the, the, it is a, it's a, some organizations think through this very, very carefully because to, what, to some extent they have, wait, they have invested a lot of money in talented people. They might believe that, they're, that their very future is dependent on talented people. So what they will do is they will spend a lot of effort selecting and recruiting these people. And when they've got them, they will spend a great deal of money on, on training and developing them. And then they discover to their horror that they leave shortly afterwards having spent all this money. Some organizations try and lock people in. So they will say, oh, well, we'll offer you a part-time uh, MBA or something over a five-year period. And they know that that will, will lock them in. But other organizations say, well, you know, movement or, or people leaving the organization is perfectly natural, and we have to deal with this. So there is um, a natural... Um, flow of people in and out of the organization. Some organizations cope with this very well. I mean, if you take McDonald's, for instance, they know that the average person is going to work there six or seven months. Some hotels know that, and they deal with that appropriately. The question is, for an organization, uh, do you want people to stay for very long periods of time? Is it good for you, and is it good for them? Do you want somebody to stay in your organization for 20 years? Or is it better for them to leave the organization and get some experience and maybe come back? And 
some many organizations don't think that way. They think it's terribly important to find these magical people, these rainmakers, these ubermensch of one sort or another. And what you should do to them is to is to lock them in and exploit their talents as much as possible. Well, people, in, you know, younger people these days think that staying with an organization for a very long period of time is not a very good idea. To to tell people you've been in an organization 20 years, they look at you with with pity that that is clearly not something that is good for you or for the organization. And many people will will want to say, well, five years or six years is is a, a great contribution, and I'm going to move on and and, and try something else. I might come back. And I think that is one of the issues that many many people in talent management need to consider is um, you know, how long is it good for them? How long is it good for you? What should you do to help them develop their talent? And particularly, um, how can you engage them such that they have a good uh, relationship with the organization and a good feel for the organization that they work for such that they might come back at a later point? Let's, let's just focus on that engagement issue because I think that's very important. I think in and, and another part of the book you talk about the upside and the downside of talent. I think because organizations are very bad at engaging talented people, they, talented people get bored yeah. and that becomes dangerous um, for, for, because they, they're, they're often quite restless and um, bad things will tend to happen. Um, so what are your thoughts about, about keeping a talented person engaged? Yes, I, I totally agree. I think you know the characteristics I've talked about, competitiveness and courage and so forth, these uh, talented people show high levels of energy, high levels of enthusiasm. And as you say, they don't want um, uh, uh, um, a, a very boring job. What some people, what some organizations do is uh, do a lot of job rotations. We know, for instance, that of all the characteristics, when you talk to people who say, looking back at your career, what, what did you learn most from? And what they say is early stretch assignments, so that when you were first got into the job, you were given some task that was actually really rather difficult. And it, it, it frequently one failed at the task, and it was that experience that taught one a great deal. Now, some organizations take that very seriously, and that they what they do is they have a, a very clear plan for those who, who are called talented. I, I've done some work for a number of organizations like this, where they give people challenges, they put them in six months here, nine months there, in different parts of the organization to understand the organization, but also to test themselves. So it's a sort of semi-Darwinian approach, because if they succeed, then they're given yet a more difficult task. But talented people, by and large, enjoy it. Moreover, I think they learn particularly from their failures. You know, if you, if you look at all entrepreneurs that we know about, people on the Dragon's Den or whatever, and you look at their history, they've all fallen down. They've all had uh, mishaps and so forth, but they've learned from those mishaps, they've dusted themselves down and they've come back. So I think the part of the answer to this is to go is to have some uh, plan for talented people to give them early stretch assignments that will stop them getting bored and frustrated. That was another very interesting part of the book. You talk about hard experience, about difficult times as being something you would be particularly interested in and if you were trying to identify talented people, you would focus on that part mm. of, of an interview um, as a way of, of identifying talent. Could you say a bit more about that? Yes, I think one of the interesting things, you know, when you talk, when you watch people in job selection and job interviews, they only talk about their working lives. They never talk about anything before that and, and you would know as a psychiatrist, that people have a history. We, we are on some sort of journey. And to get a better understanding of the individual, we need to ask them a little bit more about their lives and their richer lives. Now, what you discover with a lot of these uh, talented people is that they've had a history of mishap over which they have triumphed, they have succeeded. Uh, and you, what, what you're doing is you're looking at their biography. I often ask people, I say, you know, do you, did you have any early experience of leadership? Were you chosen as a prefect at school? Were you the captain of a school team or whatever? Did you enjoy that? What sort of major handicaps did you have as a child? Did you, were, you, were you sent to a number of different schools? Were you, were you parachuted into a school where you were potentially bullied? And very often when you meet people who have had been very successful lives, they will tell you of a number of, of handicaps or difficulties they've had in their life which they've eventually triumphed over and made them much more resilient. You see, I think one of the characteristics that people really are interested in these days is being resilient. And you have to be resilient uh, uh, in, in, in many of these 
high talent uh, positions because there's a lot of stress that comes your way. And my, my feeling is if you look at a, a person's biography, you get a, quite a good feeling for their ability to adapt to situations, to develop good coping strategies. And this will be a good indicator, one of the indicators, of how well they will develop, uh, how well they will uh, deal in a job which gives them a great deal of stress. So it's an excellent book, but to summarize, the very fact you had to write this book um, says something about how terrible organizations are in general at identifying talent, understanding what it is, developing it, nurturing it, engaging with it, and retaining it. Why are organizations so bad at this, given it's such a crucial part <laughs> of what organizations are meant to be about? Yes, uh, I tell you why. I think partly that I, I started off, of course, by buying a number of books on talent and reading them and trying to get someone to define talent. And what many organizations have done is they've been obsessed by something called the nine box grid. And basically, they usually define talent by two criteria that is, potential and performance. So they ask the question how well have people performed, low, medium, high? What potential do they have by some judgment, low, medium, high? And so this gives you the high highs, high potential, high performance, and that's the definition. The problem with the whole, uh, uh, that approach is that they've never, most organizations don't keep very good data on performance um, on an individual. If they do, they're unusual, but there's not very good performance data. And then the question is, who's making the judgment for potential? And a few people somewhere down the line who are doing some rather uh, dodgy guesswork. And on the basis of these two criteria, people are put in a talent group. And that's how it's nearly always done. Well, that doesn't work out very well. I don't think it's the way to do it. We've tried to write a book showing what you should be looking for and some of the questions you should be asking. And I think you know all organizations, I spent the whole of yesterday talking to an organization about this particular topic. I think the nine box grid is very alluring. It's very simplistic, but it's too simplistic. And this means that people have had problems in the past. They've chosen those who they think are talented, and the evidence suggests that they're not. And it's through that that I think uh, that rather simplistic approach. And we're trying to say, well, it is a little bit more complicated, not that much more complicated. Here's a book which we think might help you do it a little better. OK, but isn't there also a kind of big taboo or stigma at the, at the heart of this issue, which is you've got a group of people who are high flyers or talented, and then by definition, therefore, you have a group of people who are not regarded that way, and they're not walking around with this badge, and resentment builds up. Um, and there's this fundamental tension uh, between the notion of democracy, which is everyone should have a say, everyone should have an equal say, and the notion of elites, uh, which is like in the operating theater, no, we don't take a vote on what the neurosurgeon should do. You let the neurosurgeon decide, because he's part of an elite. Um, isn't there, a, isn't there a, a kind of modern cultural problem with the embracing of the democratic notion that, that actually talent is fundamentally antagonistic to? Yes, no, I think you're absolutely right. And what organizations try and do is they don't use the word, you know, the talent group. They talk about the gold group or the green group or the something or the other. And I say to people, you know, is it a good idea to let others know who is in the talent group? And they all say, some of them say, well, we try not to do that for the very reasons you've just said. Because if some people are treated as, as special, um, then others feel resentful, unless there's very, very clear evidence that they are special in some particular way. And so on the one hand, some organizations try and cover it up by not using the words and using other groups. Others try and cover it up by, by not letting people know who is classified as talented or not. The trouble is, of course, you can usually find out quite quickly because they're chosen to go on these wonderful courses, do exciting business schools or whatever. And so it is really, really rather difficult to hide. And I think you're right. I think particularly young people, the, the idea that there are those who are are the chosen and that there are those who are the damned really doesn't sit very well in a modern organization, uh, particularly if you are unable ever to change your, your, your grouping, that in other words you can never go from the one group to the talented group or back. And so there is this, and so some organizations say, well, everybody is talented, and that defense de defeats the whole object of you trying to identify people who have a particular type of talent. It might be true that people do have a very wide variety of talents but, and talents for different things and that you might have a talent for a sport which is not terribly useful if you're working for a bank. That might be true. 
But it is a very serious issue, and I think there is a, a, a hence, a, a, hence a, a sense, a, a little backfiring to the whole notion of talent for exactly the reasons you've specified. So you've done a lot of consultancy work over a long period of time with many um, prestigious, elite uh, companies, organizations. Many of them are household names. I won't mention uh, any of them. Uh, but um, before you go into one of these organizations to do your consultancy work, and then when you arrive, are you surprised that sometimes an organization has a reputation for being elite, um, the, the brand leader, the market leader, uh, the creme de la creme, then actually it's pretty hapless the way they deal with the issues <laughs> you, you, you raise in the book? Um, or um, is, it, is it the case that you're very rarely surprised that, that organizations that appear to be the brand leader really do seem to manage talent well? I'm the latter. I'm very surprised um, by those who are not particularly prestigious who do it really rather well and those who are very prestigious and don't do it at all well. Uh, I'm also surprised how much money they throw at it um, because you know, an HR person will go to a CEO and say, <clears throat> of course, the future of the organization is dependent on having talented people. And he or she says, yes, that's true. And he, they, then they say, well, it's terribly important. We find these people. We, we recruit them and select them, and then we, we develop them. Is that not true? And the CEO and people will say, well, yeah, that makes sense. That, that is true. And then they go ahead, and they say, well, we need a big budget for this. We need you know, the selection budget and a recruitment budget and a training budget. And then they go ahead um, without much, I think, particular thought to the, the issue. One of the, one of the problems, if you go to conferences, they all seem to be doing the same thing, and they all seem to be listening to each other doing the same thing. Um, with regard to talent. Now, sometimes the idea of benchmarking an organization who appears to do it very well is not a bad idea. It just means you're copying other people. But many, sometimes uh, in an organization, let me give you an example of one I think does it extraordinarily well, and that is the military. Um, why well, teach um, high-ranking uh, military people, uh, generals and so forth. And of course, in the military, they have uh, uh, management training. It starts on day one. They're on a leadership course for 25 years. And you don't get promoted on the basis of somebody filling out some grid. It's done very, very carefully. And one, is, one goes through a huge range of experiences for a long period of time. And they don't think of themselves as particularly good at that. But when I compare the way they do it to some very prestigious you know, banks or airlines or whatever how I work for, they do it a much, much better job. Yes, it, it takes much longer, uh, but they start much earlier. They think it through uh, systematically, and they spend a lot of effort doing it. They don't spend as much money, paradoxically, on some of these training exercises. So the answer to my question is there seems to be no correlation between the prestige of an organization and, in my view, the way they do good talent management. Professor Adrian Fernand, thank you very much indeed. The book is entitled High Potential, How to Spot, Manage and Develop Talented People at Work. It's co-written with Ian McRae and it's published by Bloomsbury Press. Now if you're listening to this uh, podcast or broadcast and you're intending to do the continual professional development or CPD element of this module, then you'll need a keyword to unlock the multiple choice questions uh, that follow in the module and the keyword is talent. Professor Adrian Fernand, thank you very much indeed. Gosh, thank you.